Hello and welcome to today's Business Skills webcast, Health and Wellbeing, Mastering Your Mental Chatter. My name is Sarah Gonzalez and I'm from Redback Conferencing. I think we all know what it's like to feel stressed and exhausted and sometimes you actually sit back and think, can I actually put up with this? Work, life, balance, we hear all this jargon but sometimes we just don't know how to master it and get into control. Today I'd like to welcome our presenter, Rose Luria. She's here to inform us on how we can all better get our health back to where we need it to be and also master our mental chatter to get rid of that negative voice that sometimes is inside of us all. So welcome today Rose, how are you? Thank you Sarah, really good. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Thank um, you. First of all I just want to, everyone has a story um, and I've heard your story and I'd like you to share that with our online audience today. So how have you learnt to balance your health amongst a busy life? Yeah, good question. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. Mm. So growing up, I was your typical type A personality. So yep. I remember growing up and some of my earliest memories were when I was at school, I got second in an exam and my mum would say to me, why didn't you get first? Or I got 98% mm. in an assignment. And it was like, well, what, what was, you know, what happened to the other 2%? So I grew up as a perfectionist, always feeling like I had to do more, be more, give more very much a yes person growing up um, and you know obviously those were good qualities to to have to really try and be my best mm. and achieve my potential and all of that um, but it ended up translating as needing to always feel like I had to be busy I had to do more and 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 that couldn't kind of very much lead to stress and so about five years ago working in a corporate role in a in a large Australian bank and about five years ago, I was planning my big fat Italian wedding. Um, I was doing CrossFit six days a week because I wanted to be the best at, again, everything that I did. <laughs> um, newly promoted in my, in my job. And I started noticing that because my life was so imbalanced, mm. so intense, I was getting virus after virus. So my, my immune system was obviously mm. compromised. And I got to a point where I was getting daily migraines and my energy levels were just all over the place and I was just feeling kind of sicker and sicker but I didn't stop mm. to take time out or address what the problem was I just tried to ignore the symptoms because they were really just a, a disruption mm. to my otherwise successful life and um, and also I had a fear that I didn't want to tell anyone that I was not really coping because I thought maybe I will appear weak or lazy mm. if I did. So I just kept pushing myself. That was not the right thing to do. Um, I learnt very quickly that you can't ignore symptoms. Um, symptoms are basically a message from your body mm. telling you that something's up. So because I didn't do anything and, and I just kept with that intensity, I ended up being diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. I was literally bedridden, unable to get out of bed, unable to do anything. And that obviously meant that I had to um, really be honest with myself mm. and, and realise, well, something's not right here. Um, so I had to make a change. And the first thing that I had to do was change my mindset. Mm. Um, I was seeing a specialist at the time who, who then diagnosed me with chronic fatigue syndrome. And he, he said, you should take a career break because I physically couldn't get into mm. the office. So I took a career break. And the first thing I did was change my mindset around how I viewed my situation. I started out as a bit of a, a victim, you know, saying, well, why me? I've tried so hard in life. Why would, you know, why would this happen to me? It's not fair. And I realised you have to take responsibility mm. and you have to realise that it's your actions, your habits, your choices that have got you to where you are. So if there's something you don't like, you have to do something about mm. it and you have to take responsibility. So how does, yep. because I think a lot of people out there can really relate to your story and, you know, yep. we're just going through the motions day in, day out. Sometimes we do feel very overwhelmed yeah. and then all of a sudden we just hit this wall and we don't know what to do and we don't know how to cope with that. Yeah. That stress and that anxiety, what impact can that have on us? Um, obviously with you, you got diagnosed with a terrible disorder. Yeah. What about everyone else out there? How can that impact our daily life, our jobs, our friends, our family? Yeah, definitely. Um, so what I'll do is I'll actually explain to you um, how stress impacts kind of your, your brain and body. Yeah, yeah. Um, and therefore how that would impact your performance at work yep. and, and really everything you do. 
So I might just start by explaining, and, and many of you listening may have heard of the fight or flight response and, and, um, and the stress response in the body, but just so we're all on the same page, I just want to explain that mm. and, then, and then talk about how that impacts us. So if you get to a place where you feel like there's some kind of danger, some kind of threat, it could be you're about to cross the road and a car's about to hit you, mm. um, you know, if you're... Uh, you know, you want to use the caveman, popular caveman example, you're walking through a forest and all of a sudden a saber-toothed tiger comes crashing towards you, uh, or comes running, sorry, charging towards you. In that moment, your body changes. In that split second, you have blood redirected from the centre of your body out to your limbs, your arms and legs, so that you can flee from that danger. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's a survival mechanism, and that's how humans have survived for so long. Um, that means blood leaves the centre of your body, all of your vital organs, and obviously impacts the way your body functions. Your brain also changes, and I'll, I'll kind of go into uh, a bit of detail about, about what that looks like. Mm. So in terms of the body, because you have blood that's redirected from your vital organs, the centre of your body, all of a sudden you can't digest your food properly, so you're not producing the right digestive enzymes to break mm. down your food. Your hormones become dysregulated. Um, on the slides that you can see, there's a number of symptoms there that you can kind of have a look through. Um, but the main ones are yeah, you're the weakened immune system, mm. which is which is really important as well, and um, higher fat storage, high blood pressure. It very much drains your adrenal glands, and your body just can't function mm. in the way that it's meant to. But what I find really interesting is how stress impacts the brain. And this is really important for how it impacts our performance. Mm. So because, think again about that blood redirection. When we get into that fight or flight response so that we can survive, so that we can get away from whatever threat or danger is there, blood is redirected from that prefrontal cortex. It's also, some people know it as the executive function part mm -hmm. of the brain, the part of the brain which is responsible for logical thinking, rational thinking, making good decisions, and instead we have blood redirected to the primal part of the mm. brain. It's kind of like, think of it like your survival instinct part yeah. of the brain. So it's impulse thinking, how do I survive here and now? And so you can't really understand the consequences of your decisions mm. uh, when that happens. And also research shows us that when you're in that state of stress for so long, prolonged periods, you have long-term changes in your brain structure and um, this impacts, you know, memory, loss of brain cells, and obviously that's linked to higher levels of, of depression and, and anxiety. So if you think about that in your workday, if you're in a state of panic, stress, mm. because you feel like it may not be a physical threat, it doesn't need to be. Yeah. If it's if you if it's a perceived threat, meaning you know, oh my God, this deadline is yeah. freaking me out, um, and you start to panic, you get into that fight or flight response. And when your brain is changed in that way, you cannot think clearly, mm. you cannot make good deci uh, decisions, your productivity is significantly reduced. Mm. And so that's, this is a really important question you ask because a lot of people want to rush the stress and yeah. anxiety to the side. So I think that's yeah. important because I think a lot of us, um, we know what it's like to feel stressed. And like you said, you do push it aside. And yeah. I think these days there's so much talk about wellness and mindfulness yeah. within a lot of organisations. We know it affects us in some physical way, but mm. I never think about it impacting me on the brain or, you know, sometimes in those yeah. moments, you know, you're fight or fl flight and you're, you know, you're running around and you're a bit foggy and yeah. sometimes I think I just need to get it done. So is that what we're talking about here? The fact that yeah. you can't actually successfully get something done when you're in that moment? Definitely, definitely. And and this is and this is actually what a lot of people say. So I, um, I do a lot of workplace uh, talks and, yeah. and workshops just to help people get in control mm. of their well-being and particularly that mental health. And a lot of leaders will actually, when we go through this, they'll start to recognise in themselves, but also in their team. Yeah. They'll realise that a lot of their team get into this like tunnel vision. Um, they may be given a fairly simple task, but because they're in fight or flight and because they can't really understand the consequence of their decisions mm. and access that logical, rational part of the brain, what would be a fairly simple task all of a sudden becomes so hard mm. for them to manage. And that's just, that's why it's so important to realise you can't just brush the stress aside because it will significantly impact, and it probably already is impacting, 
your productivity and your ability mm. to get things done. So how do we not brush it aside then and how yeah. do we deal with that stress and that mental chatter that's constantly on us um, yep. from an individual perspective but yep. also for people out there who may be in leadership roles or management roles yeah. and have teams, you know, if they do recognise it in someone, is it as easy as saying, you know, take a few days off or something like that? What are the steps that we can actually do? Yeah, yep. yep. so very, very good question. Um, so I'll, I'll start by kind of talking through how you can actually reduce that stress and the stress hormones in the mm. body and get out of fight or flight. So when we have this feeling of, you know, the stress, the anxiety, the worries, the mental chatter, all of that very much is linked to being in that fight or flight yep. um, state. Now, the interesting thing is a lot of people talk about the mental chatter mm. and they want to be able to reduce the worries in the mental chatter important to realize when you're in fight or flight we just spoke about what that means for the for the brain for the body mm. so think about it in, in that way when you're in fight or flight because your body believes that you have some kind of threat or danger around you it is in what i call problem seeking mode okay. meaning i'm i'm worried that there is a threat to my survival so therefore my primary objective is to identify the threat, mm. identify any problem around me and try and solve it. That means all of a sudden your brain is kind of heightened in, the, in that alertness and is trying to find every problem, mm. every, every worry. And that's why the mental chatter just multiplies and multiplies when mm. you're in that stress state. So in order to lower the stress hormones in the body, get back into the that kind of regulated state that the mm. body wants to be in, get out of fight or flight into what we call the parasympathetic nervous system. The fastest proven way to do that is through what we call diaphragmatically breathing. Mm -hmm. So this is the simplest way as an individual, like you asked, or even as a team together, this mm. is the simplest way you can get out of fight or flight, bring clarity and peace of mind Back, back so it's just, just um, breathing because I've heard people yeah. who do suffer from anxiety and stress, you yeah. know, the whole take a few deep breaths. Yes. Is this what we're talking about? Well, it is. Yeah. It is. Um, and, and, you know, you, of course you can get a bit more detailed and, and talk about the actual techniques. Mm. And, and, and I'll actually do it now. It would be good even for the audience just to do it together. Okay. We can even do it together. Roll play like time. You? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it, but it is simple. It's deep mm. breathing. Di the reason it's called diaphragmatically breathing is because you breathe deep into the belly mm. so that you actually shift the diaphragm. So that's what creates that change in the nervous system and gets you out of fight or flight mm. into that relaxed state. So it's it's really just breathing deep into the belly mm -hmm. and then letting it go. So that's kind of the simplest way you can reduce stress. Yep. So if we want to do it now, um, you can have your hand on your belly if you want because mm -hmm. the idea is think about it like a balloon when you inhale mm. the balloon should expand so when more air goes in so you inhale the belly expands and then as you exhale the belly sinks mm. back in and so that's kind of as, as, as simple as as really you can do it so mm. it really is so let's say you're a bit stressed at work let's say you're nervous there's a, a meeting or a presentation you're mm. about to do and you're a bit nervous about that and you can feel yourself getting a bit uh, kind of all fluttery. Yeah. Take a few deep breaths. So we can do it now. Just breathe in. And then exhale out. In and out through the nose if you can. Otherwise the mouth is okay. Just breathing in deeply to the belly. And then letting go. Mm. Just do it one more time. <laughs> Feels nice, doesn't it? And again, just letting go. It's something so simple that we oh. could do, but I, I think once again, when you're in that state of mind, yeah. you just got to get everything done. Yeah. It's hard to think about it. Exactly right. And that's why it's important to create the habit. Yeah. Um, and so, so I'm all about simple, simple habits because mm. it's one thing to know what to do. It's another thing to actually apply yeah. it. And so that's why I always recommend doing a practice like that at a particular time of day and make sure that it's the same time mm. every day because that's how you're going to create the habit. So for example, every morning, um, I always recommend to people, a lot of people catch public transport in and out of work. So take that time on the bus, on the train, mm. do your deep breathing. That has long-term benefits. And actually I want to just talk through quickly what the benefits mm. are. So 
um, you might start to relate what we just did to like a meditation because mm. it is, right? The deep breathing, it's like a meditation. And there is so much research now, and there has been for a long time, but so much research on the benefits of doing that. So that simple diaphragmatic breathing, doing that every day, again, reduces the stress hormones in the body, which is so important. Mm. So important for brain functioning, so important for body. Um, and, and there's a number of benefits there. And there's a slide that's in front of you now, again, which talks through a lot of those points. Mm. I mentioned that when you're in the state of fight or flight, you have brain cells that are lost. Science actually shows us that meditation regenerates those brain cells. So that's really? just one example. Of course, this helps with long-term greater emotional intelligence and compassion, mm. which is important for leaders as well in the workplace. It helps you solve problems easier. When you access that clarity part of the brain, mm. you can call it, it's so much easier to solve problems. It's yeah. just so much easier to get through your work day, a busy work day, with ease. Mm. And I'm all about ease. Right? Yeah. Who doesn't want more ease in their life? Yeah. Right? Um, so it's really important. Become more resilient. And it really improves sleep. Mm. Sleep is one of those health issues that so many people struggle with. And so doing a regular breathing activity like this really helps, helps to... Helps with that. To, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So when we actually talk about um, these exercises that we can yes. do, there's another one which is a practical exercise, yes. which we've spoken about before. Um, so something else for people to take part in. Um, what's the other, the 478 method yeah. that you speak about? And that's really to manage stress and maintain yeah. that balance. Um, how yeah. do we all achieve that? It is, it is. So, uh, yeah, so, so that... The, the breathing that we did before, which was simply inhale, exhale, mm. again, that's just a simple thing at the minimum for yep. people to do. I talk about this four, seven, eight breath, and it was actually um, introduced by a doctor called Andrew Weil, and mm. he's uh, he's a, an American doctor, and he started, he, he kind of um, came up with this breathing activity. I, I don't know exactly when it was, years ago, but he's all about helping people reduce stress in the body because it has so many um, or by by having high levels of stress mm. in the body, it, it increases your risk of so many diseases and illnesses. Yep. And so that's why he's really big on this. And so the four, seven, eight breath, I'll talk you through it, but this is a really practical exercise that people can do. Again, first thing in the morning, just before bed. Dr. Weil actually recommends doing this before bed. He calls it a natural tranquilizer for the nervous system. Wow. So it's really nice um, just before bed, or you can do it again bus, train, whatever, all the same benefits that I just spoke through. So 478 is, again, think about breathing diaphragmatically. Mm -hmm. Inhale for four seconds, hold for seven, and exhale for eight. The key in this is that exhaling longer than the inhale, and that's what really creates that shift mm. in the nervous system and helps to reduce the stress levels. So just for fun, yeah. why don't we go through it? Um, again, breathing in and out um, through the nose or, um, and Dr. Dr. Weil actually recommends in through the nose and then out through the mouth is another way you can do it. Both work, really. Yeah. And so what you want to do is, I'll talk you through it. Again, if you're watching, it's a really nice way to just relax. If you're in the middle of work and you need that time out, <laughs> take advantage this of this time. right now. This is your time, yeah. This is your time. Or if you're watching this later, this is your time to do it. No excuses. So again, if you want to put your hands on your belly, that just helps you be a bit conscious of mm. the belly going in and out. Um, so again, breathing in for four seconds, hold for seven, out for eight. So I'll talk you through it. So let's go. Inhale for one, two, three, four. Hold for seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale slowly for eight, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight. Again, inhale for four. Hold for seven. Exhale slowly for eight. We're going to do two more rounds. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. Exhale for eight. Last round. Inhale for four. 
hold for seven. Exhale for eight. Mm. Mm. Uh, even just having that time just for some quiet I, and just to know, right? focus on yourself and yeah. focus on something other than other people around you is quite nice. It's so true. It's true <laughs> though. Even just that quiet time, yeah. like, oh, no noise. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So you notice that I just did that for four rounds and that's what's yeah. recommended. So as you can tell, it doesn't take long. Yeah. And this is, this is what I'm talking about, creating that habit. So you, like, you know what to do if you suffer from stress or anxiety or even just a constant overwhelm. Mm. About two-thirds of the Australian workforce and most of Western societies mm. suffer from regular overwhelm and stress. Yeah. That's so significant. Um, so, and a lot of people have panic attacks and, mm. and that constant anxiety. So doing something like this every day making it a habit. Like I said, look at your schedule and think, when is the most convenient time for me to do this? Mm. Is it first thing in the morning? I like to do it first thing in the morning. It makes me feel positive and ready mm. for my day. So I love to do it in the morning. But as I said, a lot of people have free time on the bus, the train. You've got that time anyway. You might as well use it really effectively. Yeah. Definitely. So, yeah. Okay, before we move on to resilience, yeah. um, I just want to let everyone else know out there that we are taking questions for, your, for a Q&A yeah. session, which is coming up. So please type them into the chat box. Um, they'll come through the iPad and then we'll ask for those, those questions. Great. Um, any ideas or any tips that you want for your own environments as well, we'll be happy to give you some of those. So um, what about a strategy for improving resilience during a busy workday? Yeah. Because we all have them and we've gone through the stats and we know that everyone probably has them as well. How do we improve that resilience on a daily basis? Okay, good question. So um, there's a, a term called reframing, okay? Mm -hmm. And basically what reframing is, okay, we'll take a step back actually. So I spoke about the fight or flight yep. response and how all of those symptoms um, such as survival, being in survival mm -hmm. mode, not being able to access that logical part of the brain, it comes up because we perceive a threat, mm -hmm. okay? So when you see all these things in your life as negative, yep. you know, traffic, yeah. deadlines, uh, something your partner said to you or your kids screaming or, or whatever it might be, really they're not life-threatening situations. Mm. <laughs> but we perceive them as negative, stressful, overwhelming, mm. anxious triggers. There's a, so reframing means you change your perception mm -hmm. and this has a direct influence on how you respond mm -hmm. to that situation. So all of those negative effects, the body and the brain that we spoke about when you perceive a situation as bad, mm. if you reframe and see it, the challenge as, you know what, exciting um, or just an adventure. Mm. Like my motto is life is an adventure. Mm. You know, if things don't go to plan, that's okay. That's part of life. Yep. Experience it, enjoy it. And so when you reframe, it completely changes the way mm. your body and your brain reacts, which means you can much better handle the situation, which is what resilience really is about you can cope with those challenges. Okay, so I think it does sound like one of those things that we might need to practice on a regular yeah. basis because sometimes it's just, it's the last thing you want to think about, yeah. a positive situation, a negative situation. Yeah. So what are some examples of how we can achieve this, especially in the work environment? Yeah, okay. So one thing that I recommend to do, and I'll, I'll give you another thing as well, there's a TED talk by a, um, she's a, I think she's a health psychologist, yep. I think her, her title is, uh, her name is Kelly McGonagall, and if you're sending out resources after this or yes, an email, we will. great. Um, so I can just give you the um, link. yeah. Before everyone leaves, yep. just make sure you complete the exit survey with your email, um, and we'll make sure we send you a recording with all of the details that we've spoken about today. Excellent, excellent. So I'll make sure then that you have the, the copy of this yep. TED talk. Um, so it's it's really interesting. So she talks about so she's worked with Harvard and a number of universities on this particular topic. Mm. Why? Seeing stress as a good thing or a challenge as a good thing totally changes um, the way you respond. Yep. So I mentioned earlier that being in the fight or flight response, for, ex response, for example, increases your risk of certain diseases mm. like heart disease. When you change your belief around stress and see a challenge as positive, this research actually shows that you don't have that blood thickening 
like you would if you were seeing the stresses as, as mm. bad. So you actually reduce your risk of heart disease by just changing your perception. Mm. So this TED Talk I really recommend you watch because she talks a lot about that. There was one statistic that I mean, I've added here on the slide. So there was a study with about 30,000 people and they actually showed that those who experienced high stress in their life had a 43% increased risk of dying. But that was only true for people who believed stress was bad for them. The people that believed stress or a challenge was good for them actually had a lower risk of dying mm. than people with low stress in their life. Wow. Right, which is so interesting. So it is that reframing, isn't it, in your mind and the way that you perceive it? Absolutely, mm. absolutely. So watch that TED Talk. But what I recommend doing is when you have a stressful situation come up, get into a habit of stopping and asking yourself, how can I actually see this as positive? Mm. How can I get excited about it? Um, there's a, I'll just actually mention a, a quick example. Some of you might have heard of a, a lady called Dr. Libby. She's a... Yes. Um, okay, great. Yep. So she's a... Uh, God, I, th I think she's done PhD, biochemical nutritionist. Mm. So I can't remember, but uh, she's done a lot of study and she's really great. And I was watching one of her talks and she said that she went to uh, do a talk for a an audience who were either suffering from cancer, they'd just been diagnosed, they were just getting over it. And she said that afterwards, because so, she was talking a lot about stress and, and mm. how you react. And afterwards she spoke to a lot of them and she said she was just absolutely um, su surprised because when she said to them, you know, do you stress? Do you much stress about certain things? You know, how, how are you going? They all said, no, I feel like the luckiest person in the world. And, um, you know, each of them was just so grateful, mm. you know, whether they were just diagnosed, whether they were getting over it, they were through treatment. But they all reframed. So mm. they all said, you know what? Sure, I, I would rather not be in this situation. But they were just consciously being grateful, and gratitude is, is actually a really good way to reframe, grateful for what they actually mm. had. And, um, and and I mentioned before, you know, a motto for me is life is an adventure. Mm. If something doesn't go to plan, that's okay because you'll learn, you'll grow, mm. you'll experience. Life is built on contrast. You can't enjoy happiness and warmth and light and sunshine if you haven't experienced mm. cold or darkness. So, you know, you start to kind of be grateful Balance for it. that. Mm. Exactly, yeah. Something I always say as well is you always have the choice. A lot of people, I spoke about that victim mentality yeah. earlier, a lot of people will say I can't help but to react or to get stressed mm. or to be anxious. What I want to say to you is yes, you can help it. The way humans are designed is that we have the ability to make a choice. We have the ability to understand a situation and then decide how we're going to respond. Mm. There's my favorite quote, which I, um, I've got up on the slide by a, a psychiatrist called Viktor Frankl. He was a Jewish man in the Second World War. He was kept in concentration camps. He saw some horrific things. Mm. And if you haven't heard of him or seen any of his writing or his quotes, I recommend looking him up. Viktor Frankl is his name. Yep. And my favorite quote is this. Between a stimulus, so something happening, and our response, there is a space. Mm -hmm. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So we always have the ability to make a choice. It's just about making it a regular habit. And that's mm -hmm. how you can get into that habit of reframing so that you can be more resilient and just see things around you as more positive. I think, you know, that small tweak in the way that we, like you said, react to people in the workplace or, you know, your manager or maybe your staff and things that they, things that are said and your reaction determines how that's going to go, that conversation, yes. but how the rest of your day is going to go and then you get home. And I've heard this thing in the past, um, I don't, maybe you might have told me, and it's this um, concept of having a tree outside. So when you do get home as well, you hang everything up on the tree and then you go inside afterwards because you don't want to bring all that baggage yes. or everything that's happened with you into your life exactly. at the same time. So it's sort of like this balance. But then, you know, I think the, the issue is a lot of people say, you know, you know, things at work, they affect my personal life and vice versa and it's impacting my family. But you can actually take those few steps back and reframe your work situation, can't you? Exactly mm. right, yeah. So there's a, a book called The Third Space. That's yep. kind of what you're talking about, which is 
you know, you've got your work space, yeah. your home space, but you obviously, you need to be a different person at mm. home than you are at work. And like you say, you don't want to take home that baggage. So yep. that third space concept, and you can do it however you want, mm. but it's about transitioning yeah. <laughs> from work me to, you know, to, to kind of home me. So, yeah, yeah but it, it really is our choice. So. Yeah. Good, good advice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, once again, uh, we've got a few questions coming through, so sure. we'll go to those in a yeah. moment. Um, but let's just finish up on the resilient strategies yeah. here because we've spoken about busy work life, so yeah. our nine to five, or for a lot of us, maybe beyond those hours. Yeah. Um, you know, and we've spoken about resilient strategies within those environments. Yeah. Um, what about strategies that you would recommend to improve our um, stress and that mental chatter? Yeah. Or even, you know, describe mental chatter for a lot of people out there who yeah. might not even be aware of it. Okay, great. So mental chatter really is that constant worrying and voice in the mm. head. So a lot of people say they want, for example, a lot of people say they want to be able to meditate or just quieten down their mind. And they find whenever they start to do that, the thoughts become louder. Yeah. Or there's just so many, it's almost like conflicting voices in the head, you know. Um, and, and usually that's just reflective of things that you need to do. You might be thinking about the future, the past, all mm. these sorts of things. And so really those worries and that mental chatter is what keeps a lot of people in that state of stress and, yep. and fight or flight. Um, I grew up as biggest worry wart, mm. <laughs> um, always worrying about everything. And I think that that happens when you maybe grow up with a lot of other people who worry all the time. And so having that constant mental chatter and, and worrying is something, again, that really holds people in that state of stress and anxiety. So there's a particular strategy that I used to actually get out of that worry wart mm. persona, that character. And it involves kind of an element of neuroplasticity, which is really rewiring the brain. Mm. So I call this basically rewiring your resilient mind. Um, and so what, what neuroplasticity is about is we grow up, or we, we're very much raised with certain beliefs and ideas and habits in the mind, certain patterns. So if, if you have a particular trigger, your brain is kind of programmed or wired to respond mm. in that way. So if you grow up as a, as a worry wart, maybe you saw that your parents or, or someone would always worry if there was a knock on the door or something mm. like this. So the default reaction was to freak to out. To worry. Exactly, exactly. You can reprogram that and that's what that neuroplasticity is all about. And there's a diagram there on the screen. And if you think about it, so look at the first diagram there on the left. That thick white line, that represents a pathway in the brain. So a, a belief, a mental pattern, a habit. Mm -hmm. So that thick white line is that default belief that you've been raised with. So it, it, it could be any belief about anything at all, health, your, mm -hmm. yourself, anything at all. So the idea of neuroplasticity is you weaken that and you create a new belief, which is just next to it, there's a thin yellow line. That's because it's not the default belief yet. Over time, when you start to rewire the brain and you start to strengthen that yellow line, which represents the new limiting belief, you end up over a series of a month or two, however long it takes, usually it'll take about two months mm. to really reprogram that. You end up on the second image which is the yellow one, which is kind of like the new belief that you want, becomes your default. Mm. And now let me ex explain that a bit further with an example of exactly what I did. Because I grew up as a worry wart and I found myself worrying about things that were not in my control, things mm. that I, I didn't really need to worry about, things that were unnecessary. I heard this particular mantra, affirmation, quote, whatever you want to call it, from a, a lady called Christine Hasler. She's a motivational speaker and author uh, based in the US. And she said, worry is just the imagination used poorly. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's really, really profound. Worrying really is just your imagination kind of going mm. crazy. Um, it's not really serving you at all. And it made me realize, you know, if it's not in your control, then you're really just saying, well, what if this, what if that? It doesn't serve you at all. So using the neuroplasticity concept, I started saying to myself every day, worry is just the imagination used poorly. Mm. Worry is just my imagination used poorly. By saying that to myself every day for a series of months, there was a good few months that I did that, I changed, mm. absolutely changed. 
That's because my new default response, my new default thought, if there was something that used to trigger worry, my new default was, well, it's just my imagination used poorly, yeah. I don't need to worry. So that ties in nicely um, a question from one of our online attendees. Sure. And all the questions, uh, all the questions are anonymous, by the way. Um, so um, this attendee suffers from anxiety and they've yep. tried meditation using Headspace, which yep. is an app for yes. meditation. Um, the problem is that it's super hard and their mind never stops racing. So would you agree that it's about using all these techniques together? Um, you know, you've got your meditation, you've got your mantra, you know, your, your change you're reframing and using all those techniques together are more than likely going to help you progress and get rid of this mental chatter and this worry less mentality? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's why it always has to be approached holistically yeah. because everyone will suffer anxiety or stress for a different reason. Yeah. So it's always really important to speak to someone mm. about it. So if this particular audience member, um, I would recommend speaking to someone about it at work, um, see a doctor, they might be able to recommend a therapist as well because they can help you get to the root cause, which is really mm. important um, as, as to why you're suffering anxiety on a regular basis. But what I will say about not being able to, because I think you said that um, this particular audience member said they can't quiet the mind. Yeah, um, just that chatter. Yeah, the chatter. So the thing is, when you start meditation, and this is key, it's a bit of a myth to say that as soon as you start meditation, you're only doing it right if you completely quiet the mind. That's not true. Mm. I will often do meditation and I still have thoughts in my head. My tip for you is don't put pressure on yourself to think that you have to completely quiet your mind. You don't. What you want to do is help to redirect your focus. You want to redirect your focus from a lot of those thoughts which are maybe negative and you want to help to build that focus muscle and feel more positive and, and focused. And focus just means that you don't have all that constant chatter. So what I suggest is just kind of reframe, mm. change your mindset around that. It's not about completely quieting, quietening the mind. Eventually you, you might be able to do that, but it's about calming the mind and changing your focus. So for example, if you find your mind wanders to one of those worries or anxious thoughts, just say to yourself, that's okay. The mind, my mind does that, that's what the mind does. I'm just gonna now bring it back. So for example, if I'm sitting there, working on meditation, trying to be in peace, um, and then I find my mind wanders, I'll say, that's okay, mm. just redirect my focus, back to my breath, back to the voice if I'm listening to an app, and just be really easy on yourself. Because that practice will build, again, what I call the focus muscle, mm. and make it so much easier as time goes by. But again, I, I also do recommend speaking to someone about it to address the root cause mm. of why you're so anxious as well. And I think um, it's practice, right? You can't yeah. expect it. And I've done it a few times. I'm like, oh, well, this is too hard. I don't even know if I'm meditating or not because I have no yeah. idea what I'm meant to be doing. Mm. So it is that practice. And like you said, just coming back and realising that it's not going to be perfect every time, is it? No, well, that's mm. exactly right. I think you raise a really good point, Sarah. So meditation, again, take the pressure off. Mm. The po Firstly, ask yourself, why am I doing meditation? Yeah. Is it just because you want a bit of time out? In which case, you've done it successfully if you had time out, if you took that time out. Don't put pressure on yourself to be a, a perfect you know, meditator, whatever yeah, that means. Yeah. So just kind of go back to, well, what is it that I want to achieve? Do I want to just bring a little bit more peace of mind or, or you know, what mm. is it? And then just be really easy on yourself. Mm. Okay, so we're towards the end of the presentation now. So what next steps do you recommend for people online who are really looking to improve their health, um, their overall well-being and yep. sort of get back on track, um, whether it's life, uh, work-life balance or just in personal terms? Yeah, sure. So in terms of next steps, so if you, if you get the recording of this, obviously watch it back. And the key, because again, everyone's different. Mm. Everyone has a specific challenge, even in the realm of stress and anxiety, mm. everyone has a different challenge or something that they're dealing with. So really important to take some time to reflect on where you need the support. What are the specific challenges that are coming up for you? What is it that you don't like mm. right now and you want to change? Just get really clear on that because oh, I will say there's so much information out there. You can research till the cows come home, <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, you need to just focus in on, on what your goal is mm. and what your challenge is and ask 
for help. So important. So many people aren't asking for help. Yeah. I mentioned my story at the beginning. I had a fear of, you know, if I tell someone that I'm struggling, then I'm, I'm going to appear lazy or weak. Yeah. I'm so glad to say that that, that, that stigma is, is, yeah. is, 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 is really going away. So ask for help, even if it's going to be in confidence. Mm. Um, and then the other thing I suggest is go to my website, recipeforhealth.com.au, go to the blog section. You can sign up to my free newsletter because I send out free resources on a regular basis just around that. Um, it's a holistic well-being, mm. but a lot of uh, focus on reducing stress and anxiety, getting in control of mental health, but also holistic well-being as well, you know, diet, emotional eating, all of that. And that'll give you those resources and tips to, again, mm. take that information and make it a habit, which is really important. If you need, so if you're a business and you have a team or or you need some workplace assistance, you can go to the corporate wellness tab of my website, just click on that link, and that will give you some examples of the types of activities you can do with your team mm. to help the team become more resilient and energised. And obviously, I love helping, so mm. if you need help or if you want to have just a, a, a chat about how your workplace can benefit, you can click on the contact tab and in that way I can give you some tailored advice mm. as to what to do for either yourself or your team in the workplace. Great. So that's um, corporate sessions and stuff like that, lunch and learn sessions. Yeah, yep. exactly. Anything, anything, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so also someone else has just asked, and when we touched on this, um, any apps that you would recommend useful to reduce yep. mental chatter? Uh, chatter sorry. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say that it does get a little bit out of control at night time especially. So are there any apps? And we can also send you guys some links to these in the recording email, which we'll send shortly. Yeah, definitely. A couple of my favourites, uh, there's one app called Calm, C-A-L-M, mm -hmm. Calm app. I recommend that yep. and also Smiling Mind. Um, but the Calm app I found just personally my favourite and, and that's the one that I usually recommend and people take on board and, yeah. and really like that one. It's got some good bedtime um, ones as well. There are so many, but but I mean, I, I don't want to list off you know, 10 of them. Yeah, yeah. You, you want to be a bit focused, so either try the Calm app, otherwise try Smiling Mind. Um, someone mentioned Headspace mm. as well works. So um, it, the key is always, and this is always the case when it comes to whatever you're doing, meditation, yoga, anything, mm. you want to be able to connect with the guided voice. Yep. So I would recommend just listening to a couple, seeing what voice you like, what voice is quite calming. The Calm app, I, I find that the, the voices are really calming and yeah. that's what helps. Well, that would make sense. Yes, I would um, does, yes. And finally, um, you know, after all that's said and done, um, if people still are having issues, where do they go for help with anything like this? Yeah, sure. So, as I mentioned, you know, you can you can go to your doctor, mm. um, speak to a, a coach or a counsellor or a therapist. Some people in their workplaces have like an EAP, like mm. an employee assistance program. It's really important to ask for help. Um, if, you, if you want that confidential help, because a lot of people still aren't comfortable talking to people, um, then, then again, you know, speak to a doctor or a therapist. If you need, again, everyone's different. So if you need tailored advice, feel free to contact me. You've got my um, website on the slides. Um, you can even send my email out yep. as part of the, the email yep. afterwards. And I'm more than happy to uh, receive your email or your message. And then again, I can give you some tailored advice on what to do depending on your mm. specific issue. I've been there, done that. I know what it's like to be in, a, in that state where you feel out of control, overwhelmed. So important, not just for your own well-being, not just for your, the sake of your relationships um, and your happiness, but also for your performance at work. Mm. So taking that little bit of time to invest in your well-being mm. just will make all the difference for having a, a more fulfilling life. Excellent. Well, that brings us to the end. Um, thank you so much. Um, such amazing thank advice. You. And like you said, it impacts all areas of our life. So being able to take those little steps before it does get out of control, I think is yeah. important um, to everyone within Australia and every mm. organisation as well. So definitely something to be taken seriously. Exactly. Um, we'll be sending out all the recordings um, and also any of the links that Rose mentioned today in the recording email within 48 hours. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time. It's been great having you online. Um, hopefully uh, you'll be able to chat to Rose in the future if you have any questions. Otherwise, thank you once again for joining the Redback Business Skills Series. Bye for now.